Welcome to Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata, Capitulum Octavum, Lesson 3. We have three topics to discuss in today's lesson. The first topic is the uh, all about the ablative of instrument or means. And I say revisited because we've already talked about that before, so this should be familiar. And in fact, we're just getting really good at using it and recognizing it in this chapter. We're also going to be talking about... Uh, uh, a particular kind of third conjugation verb. Uh, we know third conjugation verbs already. This is uh, just going to augment what we know about them a bit and put a um, add a finishing uh, uh, final point to our knowledge of uh, of uh, the verb families and uh, basic verb conjugations in Latin. We're also going to be learning about uh, this group of correlatives, or rather, this particular instance of a correlative called tantus quantus, and we'll see that it's that this too is related to something that we already know. We first learned about the ablative of means uh, and instrument in chapter 6. You'll recall that this use of the ablative occurs without a preposition and is used to express the means by which or the instrument with which something is done. Let's look at a couple of examples. Here's our friend Cornelius. And we would say that Cornelius, Cornelius vehitur, Cornelius is carried, Cornelius is transported. By means of what? Equo by means of a horse, or in other words, on a horse. Cornelius equo vehitur. Here's a familiar scene from chapter 3 of the book where Marcus puerim probus gets in trouble. And what happens? Julius puerum improbum verberat. Well, he, he verberats Marcus with a particular instrument. He verberats Marcus with a baculum. So how would we say that in Latin? We would say Julius beats the naughty boy with a stick. In Latin, you'd say, Julius puerum improbum baculo verberat, using, again, the, uh, the ablative of instrument or means. Now, in this chapter, in this chapter, we are introduced to uh, some more uses of the ablative of instrument or means. In this case, we have Lydia, who's admiring the new ring on her finger that uh, Medus has bought for her. And we would say, feminae, Again, stereotyping here, but nonetheless, it's it's uh, uh, illustrates the point well. Feminae, women are delighted by jewelry. Feminae, delec, uh, delectantur, feminae delectantur, uh, uh, ornamentis, ornamentis. We use the ablative there, the ablative of instrument or means, the means by which uh, uh, women are delighted. Women are delighted by jewelry. Our second topic is an introduction to a particular kind of third conjugation verb. So far, we've learned about the following groups of verbs whose stems end with a long vowel. We know about the first verb family, such as vocare. The stem is voca, ends with a long a. The second verb family, tacere. The stem is take, ends with a long e. And the fourth verb family, such as audire, which the stem of which is audi, a long, uh, which ends with a long i. We're also familiar with third conjugation verbs or third verb family verbs. The ones we're familiar with are the ones that have a consonant stem. So, for example, if we take the verb ponere, um, stem of this verb is actually pon. And uh, this will become easier once we learn all of the other forms of the verb, which we uh, we'll cover in chapter 15 towards the end of the fourth quarter. But uh, nonetheless, this is a consonant stem. Uh, it's called a consonant stem. The stem of this is pon. And we can see this uh, when we get to the third person singular and plural forms of ponere, which are ponit and ponunt. We're familiar with this. We've been in contact with this uh, for uh, many chapters now. Uh, so what we're being introduced to here is um, this... Um, this idea of the third conjugation I-stem verb. What does that mean? Well, we have two examples in this chapter, and there are only two that we have to know. Uh, the first one is akipere, and the other one, oops, the other one is, if I can get the right one out, the other one is aspicere. These are our two I-stem third conjugation verbs for this chapter, and it's really all that we need to know until we get to chapter 12. We'll start seeing more in chapter 12, and then, like I said, in chapter 15, we'll see the uh, the full uh, fully conjugated verbs, and uh, at that point it'll be really easy to identify which third conjugation verbs are consonant stem verbs and which are I stem verbs. Well, for our purposes right now, what's special about I stem third conjugation verbs? Well, with akipere, we really see uh, this slight difference in the third person 
uh, in the third person plural, really, uh, the third person singular is very much like it was with uh, ponere. We see akipit, right? But you'll notice that uh, when we get to uh, when we get to the third person plural, that the ending is not unt, but rather iunt, akipiunt. Likewise, with aspikere, put this up here, aspikere, the third person singular is familiar, aspikit, but the third person plural, aspikiunt. So really what we have to keep in mind are two things. First of all, we have to keep in mind these two verbs, akipere and aspikere, and we have to remember that these are third conjugation i-stem verbs, meaning uh, that, uh, again, we'll get more into this in chapter 15, but for our purposes, what we need to understand about that is that the third person plural ends in iunt rather than unt, as it does in a regular third, con third conjugation consonant stem verb. Our final topic for this lesson, topic three, is the correlative tantus quantus. Let's take a look at an example sentence uh, to get us started with our discussion. Digitus quartus non tantus est quantus digitus medius. Here's our construction, uh, uh, tantus and quantus. And uh, what we need to understand about this, there, there are two primary things that we need to understand, excuse me, three primary things that we need to understand here. First of all, uh, tantus quantus is essentially the same in meaning as tam quam. Uh, the difference is that tantus and quantus is strictly used to talk about size. So, for example, in our, uh, in our example sentence, we're talking about finger size, digitus quartus, the fourth finger, non tantus est, quantus digitus medius. You'll remember tam quam means as, as blank as. Tantus quantus means the same thing. Digitus quartus, non tantus est, quantus digitus medius. It's not as big as the middle finger. So it's used to talk about size. The other thing to keep in mind about tantus quantus is that tantus and quantus are adjectives, so they change to match the nouns that they're describing. Let's take a peek at what that means. If I have if I have these nouns, let's see if I can fit these in here, these nouns, digitus, margarita, and pretium, um, if I were using the correlative tantus quantus to talk about these, I would say and move those over a little bit more. Uh, I would say with digitus, just as in our sample sentence, uh, uh, digitus quartus, non tantus est, quantus digitus medius. Uh, if I wanted to talk about one pearl not being as big as another or being as big as another, I would say uh, uh, margarita prima, uh, non tanta est quanta, margarita secunda something like that. The first pearl is not as big as the second pearl. Or if I want to talk about price, for example, pretium, a neuter noun, I would say tantum quantum. Uh, pretium huius annuli, non tantum est quantum ilius annuli. Uh, something like that. So the price of this ring is not as big as the price of that ring. We've talked about three topics in this lesson. We've talked about the ablative of instrument or means, revisited. We've introduced third conjugation I-stem verbs. And we've talked about the correlative tantus quantus. All of these things are discussed in more detail on the supporting, uh, the supporting reference sheet that goes along with this exercise. And, of course, any questions that you might have, uh, jot them down, take note of them, and bring them into class. That concludes our lesson number three. I hope you found this helpful. See you soon. Walete omnes.